Uh, good evening and welcome. In 2019, I gave a paper at the Oxford Patristics Conference on a panel on Augustine. I was a perhaps, hopefully, maybe humble graduate student, thrilled to be able to stay at Magdalen College in the towery city of Oxford. One morning, I found myself eating breakfast with Dermot Moran. I, as an early career academic nerd, was very excited to meet a scholar of Newman, Husserl, phenomenology, Origina, mysticism, and Edith Stein. What struck me most as I had eggs and sausage was that Dermot Moran, writer of many books, former director of the International Center of Newman Studies at University College Dublin, and inaugural holder of the Joseph Chair in Catholic Philosophy at Boston College seemed interested in, of all people, me. Me, who was the director of no centers anywhere ever, writer of zero books, and at that point, no dissertations, and a person who owned two chairs, one of which was broken. <laughs> if phenomenology, a, a school of philosophy, is in part about a close attention to things and the people who appear before us, about an empathetic encounter with others. I got to see Professor Moran live the deep ethos of phenomenology while drinking a cup of coffee. And today I get to welcome him here to the University of Pennsylvania on behalf of the Newman Center and the Collegium Institute for Catholic Thought and Culture to speak to us in a time when debates about the nature of education swirl around us. Professor Moran will look to the wisdom of two saints on what makes an education, not just a good education, but a Christian one. As Collegium and the Newman Center seek to foster such an education here at the University of Pennsylvania, at Drexel, and in the city of Philadelphia, it is an honor and a privilege to host a scholar who has thought deeply with Stein and Newman on Christian education and also offers us a chance to think with him. I'd like to welcome Professor Moran. Uh, thank you very much, Terence. Thank you. And um, I am genuinely honored to be here at this uh, Newman Institute uh, celebration. Newman's birthday was yesterday, uh, February 21st. And uh, uh, he is someone, with, and I'll share this with you uh, in, in my paper, with whom I have a sort of interesting association. Um, so I read the paper and then I'll signal I have a, an amanuensis uh, who will uh, uh, move the slides on for me. Uh, when I say play it again, Sam. Uh, <clears throat> his name is Sam. Uh, um, <clears throat> so I'm greatly honored to give this uh, 2022 annual Newman lecture at the Collegium Institute of the University of Pennsylvania, which I know is the oldest of the Newman clubs in America. And I want to thank Terence Sweeney most sincerely for giving me this opportunity to reflect on Newman and Stein. My talk tonight is a tale of two converts, John Henry Newman, uh, 1801 to 1890, and uh, Edith Stein. I'm not the first to link the two. Uh, John Paul II linked them in his encyclical Fides et Ratio. Uh, I just put my hand up each time. Uh, yeah, uh, he writes that we see the same fruitful relationship between philosophy and the word of God in the courageous research pursued by more recent thinkers, among whom I gladly mention in a Western context, figures such as John Henry Newman and Edith Stein. Um, in referring to these, I do not intend to endorse every aspect of their thought, but simply to offer significant examples of a process of philosophical inquiry, which was enriched by, the engaging, by engaging the data of faith. One thing is certain, Attention to the spiritual journey of these masters can only give greater momentum to both the search for truth and the effort to apply the results of that search in the service of humanity. Stein translated Newman's idea of a university uh, into German. This is the 
official texts that were produced by the Newman Institute in Dublin a few years ago, uh, and I recommend it. But uh, Edith Stein's way of understanding people was to translate them, and she translated his idea of a university, uh, the Apologia Pro Vita Sua, and several letters of correspondence relating to his uh, conversion. The person who recommended that Stein read Newman was the influential German Jesuit, Erich Prischwara, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Polish name, who was seeking to modernize Catholic theology by the use of contemporary philosophy, and who was a personal friend of Edmund Husserl. Erich Prischwara edited a Newman synthesis, first published in English in 1930, and re reissued recently as the heart of Newman. He was convinced that Newman is the key to the church's confrontation with modernity. And for him, Newman was the most important doctrine of the doctor of the church since St. Augustine. He invited Edith Stein to translate Newman in 1924, and she wrote then in her letter to her friend, Roman Ingarden, um, for the last year, I use these fragments of time during which my own work is out of the question to translate Cardinal Newman's The Idea of a University. The translation gave me pure pleasure. Uh, and in addition, it is very good for me to come into close contact with such a mind as Newman, something that comes along with the translation process. And I agree. His entire life was a search for religious truth and let, led him inevitably to the Catholic Church. <clears throat> um, I have a direct connection to Newman that I mentioned. I was director of the Newman Center for the Study of Religion based in Newman House um, in Stevens Green, the original home of Newman's Catholic University that he founded in Dublin in 1854 uh, with uh, Newman as the first rector. Um, Newman House consists of two adjoining townhouses and which are famous for their Baroque stucco work uh, done in the 18th century that has recently been restored and has a lot of charm, including, you can go to the next one, including the uh, secret staircase about which James Joyce wrote in his portrait of the artist in 1914. In the novel, the young Stephen Dedalus, an alter ego for Joyce, is attending lectures at Newman House. And he talks about walking across St. Stephen's Green, which is a public park in front of Newman's house. And uh, I'll skip to the part where he says he enters the somber college, it's about the middle there. He was conscious of a corruption other than that of Buck Egan and Buck Burn Chapel Whaley. It was too late to go upstairs to the French class. He crossed the hall and took the corridor to the left, which led to the physics theater. The corridor was dark and silent, but not unwatchful. Why did he feel that it was not unwatchful? Was it because he had heard that book, in Buck Whaley's time there was a secret staircase there? Or was the Jesuit house extraterritorial and was he walking among aliens? The Ireland of Tone and of Parnell seemed to have receded into space. And then he opens the door to the theater and a figure is crouching in front with lighting a fire. And the, <clears throat> and the figure says to him, who's a priest, Jesuit, one moment now, Mr. Daedalus, as you will see, there is an art in lighting a fire. We have the liberal arts and we have the useful arts. This is one of the useful arts. Um, there are multiple references in this text, perhaps a nod to Newman's idea of a university with the reference to the liberal arts over the useful arts, uh, but it also invokes the spirit of Buck Whaley, a notorious anti-Catholic rake and 18th century gentleman who originally owned the house and uh, who was uh, part of a whole group of people that belonged to something in Dublin called the Hellfire Club, a place where the devil was supposed to have appeared um, when they were playing cards. So, I mean, the irony was that this was this house turned into the house that Newman used for the Catholic University. But Joyce, being Joyce, is able to connect these different elements and feel the layers of history peeping through it. And then the discussion takes place um, they're arguing, who is the greatest writer, Daedalus, that's Stephen. Stephen noted the mockery of the question and said, of prose, do you mean? Yes, Newman, I think. Is it Cardinal Newman, asked Boland. Yes, answered Stephen. Uh, so this was uh, an important point that has been documented that Joyce, indeed, his brother Stanislaus, told uh, uh, reporters that, yes, indeed, 
uh, Joyce did admire Newman as the greatest prose stylist of the English language. And this is something that anyone who reads Newman will know. Newman never wrote a short sentence when he could write a long one. <laughs> and his prose is Latinate. So there's always clauses and subclauses, and you have to get to the end to know what he's talking about. So I know that from reading Newman, it's not easy. But Joyce, who had a keen eye and ear for the structure of language, would have admired Newman, despite uh, probably an antipathy uh, towards his, uh, his, perhaps his overt Catholicism, because <clears throat> Joyce was a lapsed Catholic. Um, now, let me turn to Edith Stein. She found in Newman a kindred spirit because they were both fascinated by the mystery of the person. Both were converts to Catholicism, and indeed both Newman and Stein invoke the same Latin maximum, maxim, secretum mei, mihum, meum mihi, I am a secret to myself, or my secret is mine, there's different ways to translate it, to express their relationship to their conversion. Both shared a deep religious faith, a strong will, a su stubborn sense of rectitude, as well as a deep concern for education and spiritual development and the cultivation of an inner life. Both had great energy, resilience, and enormous capacity to focus. Both were educated in the classics and had intense respect for the long Christian tradition stemming from Augustine. Both were committed to education and the formation of minds. Newman was an extraordinary orator, a controversialist, and a born leader. He was also a very frequent letter writer. Stein was a devoted teacher, educationalist, agitator, and campaigner for women's rights. At one point, she even wrote directly to the Pope to protest against the treatment of Jews in Nazi Germany. Both were advocates of Christian education. Newman wrote in 1863, from first to last, education has been my line. Both Newman and Stein grew up in orthodox religious communities. Newman was born into a very large family of six children. His parents were, as he said, musical, fond of plays, of dancing, of reading, and of conversation. His parents were evangelical, but in contrast to John Stuart Mill's upbringing, uh, his was liberal and free. He converted to Catholicism in 1845, and his conversion meant that he had to resign his Oxford post. And the same would later be true of Gerd Manley Hopkins, who later came to teach at the Catholic University in Dublin. Newman's efforts in Dublin are testimony to his extraordinary intellect, stubbornness, and will. Attempting to establish a university in a Dublin for the emerging middle classes, but nota bene, just five years after the famine, the first year the worst year of the Irish famine was uh, 1847. Newman gives his lectures in 1852, five years after the famine. So, you know, he was talking to a people that had been through horrors. Um, and he also, Newman also met with a great deal of resistance and hostility from the Irish bishops for a number of reasons. They had a competing contender, uh, it's a long story, to the Irish, to the Catholic University. And they also distrusted Newman as an Englishman and as a convert. Um, Newman's tribulations in setting up his university in Dublin are well documented, and I'll go on to talk about them. But briefly, just to compare, Edith Stein also grew up in a large family of 11 children whose bourgeois life they owned a lumber mill, was thrown into disorder when her father died when she was two, and her mother had to take over managing the firm. And she has long correspondence with her mother and with her sisters. She had a sister who followed her into the Catholic Church. Edith was a brilliant but rebellious child who even spent some time at home schooling. She decided she didn't want to go to school anymore, and she read at home, read the classics. But eventually she returned sat the Abitur, which is the main university exam, and attended universities in Breslau, Göttingen, and then finally Freiburg. Uh, also note, by the way, this was, she entered the university in 1911, and women only were entitled to enter German universities from 1900. She was in the very first wave of women. Uh, and she had to fight then later uh, to try and do a habilitation, the higher doctorate that would have earned her a university position. Um, Returning to Newman, Newman's tribulations in trying to set up his university in Dublin are well documented. He delivered his lectures in, in 1852, five in all, uh, in the assembly rooms of the Rotunda, which is still there, 
and um, they were published first as pam in pamphlet form and then with additional discourses finally until there was a definitive edition just before he died in 1889. For Newman, the function of a university is intellectual culture, knowledge for its own sake and nothing else, he says, and the formation of minds that are capable of discernment and wisdom and freely acting out of conscience. Education should be liberal and rounded, and for this reason, Newman included theology, by which he means, quote, the truths we know about God put into a system, unquote, among the liberal arts. For Newman, theology brought integrity to the university, and he also thought that university education should focus on the broad great issues and not on narrow vocational training, such as the utilitarians of his day, uh, Bentham and Mill, were advocating. He said it should be an al a genuine alma mater, <clears throat> knowing her children one by one, not a foundry or a mint or a treadmill. Um, what he thought, and Aristotle would have agreed, was that education is a matter of forming good habits of mind. In his fifth discourse, he says, I think this is right, yes, a habit of mind is formed which lasts through life and of which the attributes are freedom, equitableness, calmness, moderation, and wisdom, or what in a former discourse I have ventured to call a philosophical habit. I would like to say that, uh, and this has been the topic, I think, of other discussions about Newman, conscience was central to Newman's concept of uh, religion. And it's interesting, and this is a connection that many people don't know, Edith Stein studied with Edmund Husserl, a Jew who converted to Christianity, to Protestant Christianity, and uh, who was a close friend, as I mentioned, of Eric Prishvara, the Jesuit. Husserl's inspirational mentor was none other than Franz Brentano, a Catholic priest who was very well known as part of the revival of scholasticism in Germany in the 1870s. Brentano visited Newman in Birmingham in 1872 to seek his counsel as to whether to leave the Catholic Church because he opposed the new doctrine of the infallibility of the Pope. Newman was committed to dogma and the truth of the Christian religion, but also to personal freedom of conscience. He wrote, Newman wrote, the supremacy of conscience is the essence of natural religion. The supremacy of apostle or Pope or church or bishop is the essence of reveal. Newman advised Brentano to follow his conscience and it's a long story, but in the end, Brentano left the Catholic Church and lost his teaching job in Würzburg, a Catholic university in Germany, and ended up as a privat docent or sort of lower level instructor in Vienna, where uh, uh, um, Husserl studied with him. Newman himself treaded more carefully on the issue of papal infallibility, as our last year's Newman lecturer, Eamon Duffy, has shown. Uh, he, in fact, opposed papal uh, infallibility in 1870, but then he embraced it once he, it had become dogma. He wanted the Pope to safeguard the repository of Catholic tradition. In general, for Newman, Christianity is not just a set of dogmas, it is a living, breathing, evolving, evolving system of thought. So in this sense, he defended the historical evolution of truth as opposed to its static nature. Furthermore, for him, the past cannot be uh, uh, repeated. And in this sense, he was a modernizer. He was seen as a modernizer in the 19th century. Um, now, a little bit about his uh, new university. Uh, having been denied the opportunity to found a Catholic college at Oxford, Newman wanted to bring his vision of education to the Catholics of Dublin. Now, there was a widespread British prejudice throughout the 19th century against Irish Catholics as lazy, stupid, ignorant, quarrelsome, ridiculous, and even depicted as subhuman. Uh, you would be shocked if I were to show you the images uh, that regularly appeared in the British uh, press of the 19th century about Irish people. And the famine didn't help this. It was regarded as largely their own fault. So. Uh, when Queen Victoria gave a certain sum of money for Ireland for famine relief, in order not to show her partiality, she famously donated the same amount to the cats and dogs home. So that, that's the discourse of the mid-19th century. Newman, who is something of an innocent abroad, comes to Ireland 
determined to restore Ireland as a place of centre of education as it had been during the uh, late uh, early medieval period when it was called so-called Ireland of Saints and Scholars, something that um, Thomas Cahill has written about in this book, popular book, How the Irish Saved Civilization. Basically, Ireland was never conquered by the Roman Empire. Uh, so uh, when the Roman Empire collapsed under the invasions of the uh, Goths and others, Ireland was unaffected and continued to maintain a tradition of Latin and Greek learning, which they then exported back to the continent. And that's my other subject, John Scotus or Eugena. And in fact, uh, and I could talk about this at some other stage, Newman wrote on our Eugena and was very interested. At one point was even calling, wanted to call a magazine after him. Now, um, in the introduction to the idea of the university, um, yeah, um, he, he does acknowledge that it would be extremely difficult for him uh, to set up a university. Um, but he says, you know, he is not unaware that now you have to again, this is 19th century. You might bristle a little bit at some of this language. I cannot forget that at a time when Celts, the Irish, and Saxon, the British, were alike savage. It was the Sea of Peter that gave them both first faith and then civilization, and then again bound them together in one of by the seed of a joint commission to convert and illuminate in their turn the pagan continent. I cannot forget how it was from Rome that the glorious St. Patrick was sent to Ireland and did work so great that he could not have a successor in it. The sanctity and learning and zeal and charity which followed in his death, but the result of the impulse he gave. Uh, I won't read the rest of it, but um, he, 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 in some sense, likens himself to St. Patrick, uh, who had come to bring Christianity to the Irish, having been a former slave of the Irish, and had therefore learned Gaelic, and so when he became a priest, priest knew immediately where to send poor Patrick back to the Irish to convert them. Uh, and that's another story I could talk, tell at some stage. Uh, but um, Newman wanted to recreate that golden age uh, in 19th century Dublin among the Catholic bourgeoisie. His first, his university opened to 20 students. And he was constantly writing, looking for money because he never had any. He was looking for rich benefactors. And in the end, the, the he left it because he failed to raise enough money for the university and couldn't get support. And eventually the university was handed over to the Jesuits. Um, right, I'll just skip on a little bit here. Um, what's next? Uh, oh yes, I, um, that's the point about his modernity, but we can skip it. He was just saying that the path, this is it, yeah. <clears throat> uh, in one of his discourses on the idea of a university, Newman talks about enlargement of the mind through education. That only is true enlargement of the mind, which is the power of viewing many things at once as one whole, of referring to them severally to their true place in the universal system, of understanding their respective values and determining their mutual dependence. And Newman was critical of people who could, and this is the next slide, travel the world like sailors, he says, and not come up with any, not gain anything from it. He says they sleep, they rise up, they find themselves now in Europe, now in Asia, they see visions of great cities and wild regions and so on, and nothing which meets them carries them forward or backward to any idea beyond itself. Nothing has a drift or a relation, nothing has a history or a promise. Everything stands by itself and comes and goes in its turn like the shifting sheets, shifting scenes of a show, that's hard to say, uh, which leave the spectator where he was. So that he thinks is the kind of veneer, uh, very common, by the way, among young nobility, Lord Byron was one in the 19th century, of taking the grand tour, as it was called, where they would uh, travel around Europe and look at things like Pompeii and so on. But he's saying that that kind of education, where it is all seems the same, it's like flipping channels. It, nothing, nothing sinks in. They, there's no relationship between things. That is what has to be challenged by a genuine education. That's my, one of my strong points about where I agree with Newman's idea of a liberal arts education, connecting things together into one whole, as he says. Instead, Newman wanted a mind that was expanded by knowledge. We saw that earlier and tempered by reason 
that mind, as he says, that learned to leaven the dense mass of facts and events with the elastic force of reason. Next one. <clears throat> the man who has learned to think and to reason and to compare and to discriminate and to analyze, who has refined his test, taste and formed his judgment and sharpened his mental vision, will not at once be a lawyer. I should say this to half of my undergraduates in philosophy. When you ask them what they want to do, they want to go to law school. And uh, uh, a man of business, uh, I think I saw one earlier here studying business at Villanova, or a soldier or an engineer, but he will be placed in that state of intellect in which he can take up any of these sciences or callings with an ease, a grace, a versatility, and a success to which another is stranger. So Newman's practice as a university professor was indeed very personalistic. And I, you mentioned this, I agree with that. You have to core ad core loquitur was his model, uh, his motto. Uh, heart speaks to heart. That's the old platonic idea that you can't put everything down in writing, that you influence people by reaching through to their hearts. And his practice as a university professor and tutor was very personalistic. He had already been responsible for the introduction of, you know, Newman was responsible for the introduction of the tutorial system in Oxford. And he had promoted the reform of the university as a tutor and fellow of Oriel College. And in Dublin, he similarly divided his small group of students into houses. So there were five or six of them living in different houses. So they would have a sense of identity. And he was interested in offering evening classes for those who worked during the day. And he was subsequently responsible for founding Ireland's first, well, he was the initiative, took the initiative, was founded afterwards, of Ireland's first medical school, Cecilia Street Medical School, which had degrees that Newman's University recognized, uh, and uh, which was open to women for the beginning. People often wonder about uh, Newman's rhetoric of the idea of a university, because it's all about the notion of a gentleman. But Newman was very interested, he didn't write a lot about this, but the Cecilia Street Medical St School was uh, an example of how he uh, uh, promoted education uh, for women also, although that is definitely not large on his agenda at that time. Um, so let the mention of women allows me to turn to Edith Stein. So I think we can go on. There she is. Yeah. Edith Stein was a brilliant and original philosopher and teacher, the 11th child of a Jewish family, as I mentioned, who converted to Catholicism and later became a Carmelite nun and took the name Sister uh, Theresia Benedicta Acruce. She was a feminist educationalist in the 1920s, a public scholar, a mystic, and eventually a victim of the National Socialist policy of extermination of Jews. Uh, leading to her death in Auschwitz in 1942. She and her sister, Rosa, who accompanied her. Edith Stein converted, uh, you can flip on to the next one. Uh, this is her, uh, she served as a nurse in the Great War. So she directly was involved with uh, uh, suffering and observing. And, and so it was quite natural, if you skip to the next one, that she would write on uh, empathy, at the University of Göttingen. You can skip to the next one. Yeah, her doctoral dissertation was on the problem of empathy uh, in 1917, uh, directed by Edmund Husserl. And Husserl had written a lot about the self and knowing oneself in self-knowledge, but his public lectures on empathy were not known. So Stein's work on empathy, on the problem of empathy, published in 1917, was enormously important. Uh, later on, it's referred to by people like Maurice Merleau-Ponty and others. Um, anyway, uh, the brief version of this, if you go on just here. Uh, she was, Stein was visiting her friend Codwin, Henrik, Hed, Hedwig Conrad Martius. And I should say that there were very few women studying philosophy. There was a lot of women studying education in the universities to become high school teachers. But Edith Stein and this woman, Hedwig Conrad Martius, went on to become a professor in München after the war. Uh, they were very strong, ardent feminists. She, Hedwig Conrad Martius was a Protestant. Uh, Edith Stein was Jewish. But in visiting Hedwig Conrad Martius's house in this place, Bergzabern, 
1921, she read the life of Teresa of Avila, just picked it up casually. And over the course of a night, she said, this is the truth. She was always searching for truth. This is a motif of her work. And she was converted uh, a few months later uh, in the 1st of January, she, she was baptized and thereafter became a Catholic. She still sought a university education, but, and this was the problem for women at the time, no one would take her on. She was able to do the doctorate, but you, in order to teach in the German university system, you needed what's called a habilitation, which is the second doctorate. And she needed a professor to mentor her, and none would, including Husserl. He actually said to her, look, if there's a written letter, uh, if the academic profession were more favorably disposed to women, I would give you a reference, but I don't think it's suitable work for you. And so she was very angry. She wrote to the minister. She campaigned. She eventually had the law changed to force people to take women as habilitation candidates. Uh, but by that stage, uh, she had decided uh, to enter uh, uh, to a teaching. She entered a convent, started teaching, and eventually became a, a, a nun in the 1930s, partially probably around the time of the Nazi uh, takeover. Um, <clears throat> Stein was a, a philosopher already at the time she had converted, but she had hoped for an academic career in philosophy, but was frustrated by not being able to find a, Husser, a, a professor who would mentor her for the habilitation. Um, and this led to her ag agitation, as it were, and she was an agitator in the 1920s for women's rights. Stein comments on Newman in one of her essays, The Ethos of Women's Professions, where she defends the idea that women's nature is perfected by work, and not just work in the home as a wife or a mother, but in the workplace, what she calls solid objective work. She thinks that applying work oneself to work is a discipline of obedience. And this allows one to overcome what she calls, and again, it sounds like Newman, one-sided specializing and enslavement to a discipline that she says has so distorted masculine nature. Um, right, if the next, uh, we, we flip on a little bit because I want to move past her uh, next one, I think. Yeah, yeah, uh, she writes, <coughs> in her ethos of women's professions. Here we have the parallel to the image of the perfect gentleman which Newman sketches in the idea of a university, a cultivation of personality which somehow resembles true holiness. But in both cases, it is simply a matter of similarity. The nature restrained only by the influence of education maintains its cultivated exterior only to a certain point. Then it breaks through all bounds. Only the power of grace can uproot and form fallen nature anew. It happens from within, never from without. How this takes place in feminine nature, we'll consider later. But she has a theme here and elsewhere through her book. Um, I brought a copy. Her collected essays on women are translated as the woman, um, essays on woman in the collected works of Edith Stein by the Carmelites. Um, and very well worth reading. For Stein, as for Newman, na nature is not enough. Grace completes and perfects nature. In her philosophy, and I don't really have time to go into it here, she took issue with uh, uh, Heidegger, for example. When Heidegger's Being and Time came out in 1927, anyone who knows this book will know it's all about angst and uh, people facing into this emptiness and nothingness, and that human life is always uh, unfulfilled, that it breaks off before it can be fulfilled. And so she wrote a review of it, where she said, no, that's not people's experience at all. People gain their deepest uh, human experiences in love, in fulfillment, in, in wholeness. Um, you know, and in German, Heil, Heilig for whole and Heilig for holy, uh, they sound the same in English, but they're the same in German. Uh, <clears throat> for her, life is fulfilled in love, and God for her is fullness and overflowing love. She had a concept of the divine as overflowing love that was impartially inspired by Dionysius the Areopagite, uh, the supposed uh, student of St. Paul 
a mystic, whose work she translated from Greek into German. So she was like, uh, she translated Newman from English into German and Dionysius from Greek into German. Uh, and to my knowledge, I don't know where she learned English. Uh, and people tell me that the German translation of it is very good. Um, um, so she says uh, that God's love is an overflowing love which wants nothing for itself but bestows itself freely, mercifully. It bends down to everyone who is in need, healing the sick and awakening the dead to life, protecting, cherishing, nourishing, teaching, and forming. It is a love which sorrows with the sorrowful and rejoices with the joyful. This is her theme of empathy. It serves each human being to attain the end destined for it by the Father. In other words, it is love of the divine heart. And this is a very strong theme. Um, she writes, this is not, uh, I don't have this up there on the slide. The life of an authentic Catholic woman is also a liturgical life. Whoever prays together with the church in spirit and in truth knows that her whole life must be formed by this life of prayer. Um, and after her con conversion and her failure to get an academic position, she moved to a teaching position, teaching girls in a high school uh, a formation for um, teachers, and then she moved into a community. And she writes, those who live with Holy Church and its liturgy, i.e. as authentic Catholics, can never be lonely. They find themselves embedded in the great common humanity. Everywhere, all are united as brothers and sisters in the depths of their heart. Stein had a unique philosophy. I think that might be up there if you want to go to the next one. Uh, okay, no, uh, leave that up there. I'm going to come to that. Uh, Stein, had, this is what happens when you are preparing PowerPoints an hour before your talk. You can't remember the order in which they were. Um, Stein had a unique philosophy of the person, which specified that each person has what she calls a core, a kern. She sometimes uses the phrase heart. She was a friend of um, uh, a number of Catholic. Uh, philosophers of the time. Max Scheler had converted to Catholicism and was also writing about the heart, but especially Dietrich von Hildebrand, who was another phenomenologist and a very brave opponent of the Nazis who had to flee Germany, came to America, taught at Fordham, I think. Um, Dietrich von Hildebrand has a whole theme of the heart. It was two words, gemüt, which is kind of like feeling center. But Stein believed that Persons, each, every individual person has a unique, inviolable, unchangeable core, a kern. She talked like a kernel that unfolds in a process that she calls literally blooming or blossoming, entfaltung in German, and which for her uh, allows the person to ripen. This concept had already been introduced in her first book, Empathy, but continues to be developed in her Catholic writings in the 1930s. She wrote two main. Catholic works, Potency and Act, kind of uh, where she tried to uh, bring together Thomas Aquinas and Edmund Husserl, and another book, Finite and Eternal Being, uh, which was a direct attempt to refute Heidegger's being in time. For Heidegger, being is essentially temporal. For, uh, for, for Stein, we have an eternal core at the heart, which uh, she claims we can never fully exhaust. So for example, someone can never fully complete the love that they have for various people. But you know, we know, let's say, we can call someone generous, even though they aren't always called to do acts of generosity. It's radiating from their nature. So she had a view of the inner individual nature, which is remarkable, I think, and, and very different for, to many of her uh, colleagues, including Thomas Aquinas, who she disagreed with. Thomas Aquinas thinks we're all the same insofar as we're all human beings, rational animals. And she thinks, no, there's an individual essence to Edith Stein and to uh, uh, you know, Newman and everybody else. And that essence is something that she tries to protect and foster in education. Okay. Um, Sch Shaler had proposed for a short time in his career, a Catholic phenomenology, whereas Heidegger on the other hand, had rejected the very idea of a Catholic philosophy uh, as akin to something as absurd as he says, a wooden iron, 
typical example of something that's a contradiction in terms. Because philosophy for Heidegger was independent of faith, whereas Edith Stein believed in Catholic philosophy and a Catholic worldview. And in this regard, she follows Thomas and Newman. And there is a very interesting uh, phrase that she has. Meanwhile, it cannot be admitted that all truths of revelation are accessible in principle from natural knowledge. Catholic faith stands and falls with the mysteries and inaccessibility for natural knowledge belongs to the idea of mysteries. This inaccessibility does not mean incomprehensibility. Revelation is indeed truth and obviously becomes truth for us. And so we gain knowledge, which we inwardly make our own, a truth of revelation. The inaccessibility for natural knowledge means that we require supernatural life to obtain to knowledge of the mystery. I think that is probably the center of her view about the relationship between faith and reason, the very theme, fides et ratio, that John Paul II had commented on at the beginning of my talk when I quoted that uh, sentence from him. Um, so her view is, time to wrap up, okay. Um, I, 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 um, I think we can conclude and move to question and answer. I'm terrified I'm going to knock something over here. Uh, um, I would like to say a little bit about Stein's Catholic feminism. Uh, and in order to do that, we have to understand that she meditated deeply on the nature of women in that set of essays that I've shown you. She campaigned on issues of human rights in the workplace and especially on women's education and on women's Christian education. Uh, she was an ardent feminist of the time who fully subscribed to the right of women to have access to the workplace. And indeed, she maintained there is no position that uh, a man occupies that a woman cannot occupy either. And she refers to things like the most manual labor in factories and so on. Uh, so she had no problem at all with that. However, she did, in line with this view that individuals have distinct essences, also think that women have a distinctive character that's different from men. Now, there's arguments can be made about this, uh, but she strongly said that. Um, and she did note that while women can accomplish themselves in every profession, she says, however, in a woman, a soul comes into her own that is formed by a woman's profession. And she claims that some of the radical feminist uh, movement of her day, the suffragettes, had missed that. So while they wanted access of women to the factories and to work in the public domain, they hadn't tried to feminize work. They had rather absorbed, or you might say it was sort of identity or equality feminism rather than distinctiveness of the women's contribution. So uh, she wrote, one may say that even the professions whose objective requirements are not harmonious with the feminine nature, those termed specifically masculine could yet be practiced in an authentic feminine way if accepted as part of the concrete human condition. Furthermore, she says women's participation in all professions would be a blessing for society. Stein had an image of women's character as based on an ethos, and she refers to the notion of ethos in relation to what the scholastics called habitus. And there she invokes something very close to Newman's view of education as being formed by habit. She writes, temperament is an inborn habitus, a natural basic disposition of the soul, such as cheerfulness or melancholy. These attitudes are acquired on the basis of natural tendencies, have all natural proficiencies and virtues as important. There is finally the established habitus, there are above all the divine nature, divine virtues, which constitute the holiness of human beings. Um, so I, I, I'll have to finish on that point, but her view, because we were out of time, but her view was, as I said earlier, uh, that uh, her, she was following Husserl as a phenomenologist. She deeply believed, uh, as did Merleau-Ponty and other phenomenologists, that embodiment is central to the human condition. We're not souls uh, in a vessel of the human body, but we are through and through incorporated, incarnated. Uh, so she is very strong on the notion of incarnation. But with that, we also have uh, given natures. 
And those natures are, as she says, partial, and she mentions it here, we have different temperaments. Some people are naturally uh, exuberant, others gloomy. And she's saying that education has to be tuned to temperament. This was close enough to Heidegger, who emphasized highly that mood is very important to understanding. Most of the time we're in a kind of everyday mood, we're not in one particular mood or the other. Heidegger emphasizes anxiety and moods that make us face the emptiness and nothingness of existence. She emphasizes moods of joyfulness, collaboration, empathic communion, and a different kind of embodiment. But she never denies embodiment. She writes at some point, the soul sinks its taproot into nature. And so this is something that for her is very important, and also very important in her version of feminism, that women and men have distinctive natures. And she thinks that although they have common purpose and so on, there are basic differences, just as there are individual differences between different human beings. So there's a lot to discuss, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, she is in many ways, uh, the, I'll just read my conclusion because I think that says it. Uh, there are obviously aspects of Stein's approach and Newman's that do not conform well to the reigning spirit of our age. But she believed, as did Newman, in bearing witness and she paid for it with her life, hence her martyrdom. She was extremely stubborn when she felt she was in possession of the truth. And I think her view of personhood, of individual essence, of this current of the uh, core of the personality, of grace completing nature, all agree with Newman, so that we deserve to consider Edith Steinman as a true follower of Newman and an exemplification of his ideal of the gentle person, the educated person. Thank you very much. Thank you.